I'm going to tell you a story now. It's about this fish here on my arm. That's an Atlantic cod. I started getting tattoos of endangered animals a year ago in the middle of a period of heavy discouragement. I'd been working on climate change for about a decade. And 10 years ago, we thought we still had plenty of time. We thought there was maybe 100 years until the worst effects would be felt. But in the decades since then, the science has grown immeasurably more terrifying. Climate feedback loops are already being triggered. For example, methane from the permafrost up north is pouring into the atmosphere, and it's 20 times stronger than the normal greenhouse gas carbon dioxide. The ocean is acidifying and making it hard for small shelled creatures to form their shells and survive, and those are at the bottom of our food chain. And the Arctic and Antarctic ice melt threaten 20 feet of sea level rise in this century. So we're now in a race against atmospheric physics and chemistry, and it's one that we could lose. I was tired of attempting to persuade with reason and words, and I wanted to do something more creative. So I set out to have my body tattooed with images of some local threatened iconic animals. The mild pain of the tattooing process was somehow comforting and appropriate, and the idea that I might go into my grave at the same time these animals went into extinction seemed like the right metaphor to use to tell their stories. So here's a story I call Cod Forgive Us. <laughs> the Winslow Homer slide up there on the screen. You see a fisherman in a dory. His bare hands are on the oars, and he's looking over his left shoulder at the schooner that launched him. Behind the schooner is a bank of fog. And if that bank of fog covers his ship and he can't find it, he will die of exposure or drown. A very common death for fishermen at the time. Between 1800 and 1900, 4,000 fishermen were lost from the town of Gloucester, Massachusetts alone. In front of the fisherman in the boat is a large white fish, and we're going to assume that's a cod. The fisherman caught that fish with the ancient technique called hand lining. You just drop a line into the ocean with a hook on it, bait. The cod are so slow and so uninterested in fighting that they just grab the bait and you can reel them up hand over hand. They don't put up a fight at all. Bottom-dwelling fish swim with their mouths open. They just eat whatever comes into them, and that's what gives them that sweet white flesh that we love. It's like fish sticks, right? The new world was discovered thanks to cod. The supply seemed inexhaustible for years. It was rumored to be possible at the time of the settlement of the United States to drop a basket into the ocean and just pull it up full of cod, no bait at all. Dried cod is 80% protein, and it's preserved by salting for long ocean voyages, making it the ideal food to sustain sailors for a long time. So fueled by cod, explorers got to this world, and settlers got to this world in New England, where they built economies on cod fishing. And you didn't get this in American history class, but for all the rhetoric about self-determination and independence, the leaders of the, our revolution had economic autonomy in mind when they declared independence from England. That autonomy in this part of the world was built almost entirely on cod fishing. Fishing made many men rich, and it could say, sustain any man like that one and his family if he were willing to risk that life. So going back to that fisherman now, he's still out there, but now he's working on a factory ship that catches and processes 24,000, I'm sorry, 54,000 ground fish an hour, 24 hours a day. The way these fish are caught is that giant trawler nets are, are trawling the bottom of the ocean constantly, leaving behind nothing alive in their wake, like a watery desert. And the factory ship workers are still enduring a very high-risk lifestyle. On deck, they might be caught by nets or lines that are paying out too fast and dragged into the ocean and drowned. And below deck, they might be mangled by the machinery they work with. In the 1990s, it became clear that the 500-year party was over for cod fishing in New England. Catches had been in decline for over a decade, and drastic regulation became necessary in order to preserve what stocks were left. So the big trawlers went elsewhere to fish. The large processing operation started to bring in Norwegian and Russian cod to make our fish sticks. And small inshore fishermen, like those in Gloucester, lost their livelihood and their lifestyle. And now scientists are warning that there's no guarantee the cod will return at all. Overfishing has allowed other species time to gain prominence in their former ecosystems. And climate change has warmed the waters of New England enough so that they are going elsewhere, the cod are going elsewhere to spawn. So who is entitled to the life of a fish? 
small fishermen, big corporate fishermen, children eating fish sticks in a Midwestern cafeteria, or you and me eating fish and chips on Cape Cod, the fish itself. The story of cod is a story of human hubris, of our arrogance, of our sense that nature is boundless and it's there for us. So let's move to Cape Cod now. It enters into this story as an iconic vacation spot for Bostonians. I think we've probably all been there. In my own life, my parents met and married there in the town of Woods Hole 50 years ago, and they were able to buy a little cottage sometime after that. My whole family squishes into that cottage for a month every year. And we have probably the same associations that you have with the Cape, right? Beaches and boating, ice cream, fish and chips, all the good times. Cape is like Boston's playground. So here's a Cape Cod story. It's tied to this other animal on my shoulder. That's a great blue heron. In the spring of 2014, glacier scientists broke the news that the West Antarctic ice shelf was now in irrevocable decline, meaning even if climate change were stopped immediately, it would not stop melting. And this is an enormous mass of ice. It contains at least enough water to raise sea levels worldwide by 10 feet. Since then, a year later, we got more news from a very significant climatologist, James Hansen of NASA, who says that the number might be closer to 20 feet and the time frame might be as little as 50 years. So this is an example of a positive feedback loop, a way by which climate change accelerates itself even without human input. But let's think of it in a more personal way. You're standing by the shore, anywhere. You can look up for a marker 20 feet higher than the current sea level and think everything underneath that will be underwater within a century. On a magnificent day in August of 2014, I took a bike ride with my son and my sister on Cape Cod. We left Woods Hole and we followed the bike path 10 miles to the great Sipawisset Marsh. And I stopped there a long time to watch the birds. I saw egrets, cormorants, gray herons, plovers, and then I saw the single great blue heron stepping through the marsh with its long legs in the green grass, reflected in the glassy water. And we came back, finished our ride, we went to a coffee shop, but had coffee and pastries, and it was such a beautiful day, right? Such a happy time, and I couldn't stop thinking, that marsh is already gone. There's nothing we can do that will prevent it from being submerged in the next hundred years. So I wish I could assure you that this is all about saving some beloved animals, but let's reckon with the facts. 50% of our wildlife globally has been lost in the last 40 years. 50% in 40 years. Here's a monarch butterfly on my arm. Last summer I saw three of them, this summer I saw none. They've been decimated by pesticide use and also by freak storms that hit in their overwintering habitat in uh, Mexico and kill them off by the billions. There's a bumblebee on this arm, it's inside the snake. If we lose the pollinators, our own species will follow in a matter of years, we can't survive that. On my right shoulder, I have a sugar maple tree. Due to warming winters in New England, they're disappearing from our New England forest, and they're taking the entire sugaring industry with them. So who authorized this? At what point did we trade monarchs for McMansions, or do we exchange the red maple trees of New England for the comforts of cheap airline travel, for example? And did we think we were sacrificing birds and marshes so that we could have beachside motels with central air conditioning? No, it wasn't like that. Nobody meant for this to happen, right? We didn't intend to sacrifice the natural world. It wasn't conscious and it wasn't deliberate. No one is to blame and yet we are all responsible. But frankly, some of us are more responsible than others. For decades, big oil companies suppressed and minimized the data on global warming because it would affect their bottom line. They hired unethical scientists to confuse the issue, making it seem as if there was some question about whether climate change was actually happening and who was causing it. And there is no question. It's clear now, 97% of scientists agree that this is real, this is happening, and it's caused by us. So this is the sixth great extinction in the history of the planet, happening now, caused by human beings. How do we stop it? 
How do we preserve what is left? Undo the damage, if possible. I can tell you that the solutions actually exist. That's not the problem. There are technologies that create clean energy, and there are those that can conserve and repair the Earth, even. But what may be lacking is the human will to do this. So I'm going to leave you now with the three broad concepts that I use to guide my work, because it takes some effort to keep this, um, to keep this going, um, these, this grief and these facts and these stories in my own life. So the first concept I want to share is that of witness. Witness means you look squarely at a problem, you don't turn your back, you don't avert your eyes, and you don't shut down your heart. The second concept of that of sacrifice, because the age of carbon is over. It has to be in order for us to survive and for all these other creatures to survive. So in the coming few years, we'll be required to give up using fossil fuels. And this is going to be hard. We're going to have a lot smaller lives. It's a good idea to envision that, at least, and think about what your place in it is. The last concept is that of resistance. And I had a tattoo made just for this one. So here's a Massachusetts timber rattlesnake on my arm. Fierce little creature it reminds me of our power to resist those who would destroy and deny. And I had some words written on it next to it, a slogan that reminds me how to face my work. It says, respect existence or expect resistance. Thank you.